Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Such a wonderful, wonderful event to celebrate Roger and Manny. And, uh, and I had a really difficult task to start today. My task is to introduce Roger. And, uh, and the reason why it's so difficult, there's so much to say that I can talk for three hours nonstop. I would not, I would not do justice to his career. However, every time that I make an introduction, I remember the words of my father that he told me, any time that you make an introduction, be brief, remember, you are not there to listen to you. It was somebody else. <laughs> so I'm going to try to keep it very brief. And, uh, and I'm going to focus mostly on Roger's uh, career at uh, Occidental. Roger received his BA in political science from Stanford, and then he also got his PhD from Stanford and uh, in political science. Eventually, he saw the life of Southern California and decided to move to Occidental. And uh, so he came to Occidental in 1977 as an assistant professor of political science. He was promoted to the rank of associate professor in 1982 and then to the rank of professor in 1988. He became the Arthur G. Kuntz, a distinguished professor of history of ideas in 1996. Professor Boshe, or Roger as we all know him, has contributed to the college in many, many, many significant ways. He is an award teaching <coughs> professor and uh, he is a uh, a, a remarkable contributor to service. He served as the chair of the faculty council from 1990 to 1992. His scholarly record is remarkable. Goes on for pages and pages and pages. He has published five scholarly books, over 20 scholarly articles, and many other contributions in there. In terms of national awards, he has received several fellowships from the National Endowment of the Humanities, Another, a few fellowships from the Ames Foundation and grants from the Earhart Foundation as well. At Occidental, he's received all the awards that a faculty member can receive. In fact, <laughs> one of them more than once. And uh, he received twice the Northwestern Award for teaching. He received the Grant Sterling Award for research. And he also received the Linda and Todd White Teaching Award. And uh, Roger, Professor Boshe, is an institution. He embodies everything that makes Occidental special. He is the embodiment of Occidental College. And uh, so it's absolutely thrill to be able to have him today, to have this conversation with him and with Mandy. But an introduction would not be complete if I only focus on his academic record. We also need to talk to him as a person, as a colleague. And to do that, we have asked one of our colleagues from the history department, Nina Kelberg, to actually talk to about Roger at a more personal level. So Nina, if you want to join us. Hi, and welcome. So it's an enormous joy to introduce my dear, dear friends, Roger and Mandy, standing there in the wings. Roger and I have team taught together for over 35 years various incarnations of a core class on European culture for incoming students. So we've been very connected here at Oxford. <coughs> Roger's brilliant lectures in our course have concerned political theory, of course, and literature. So he has introduced literally thousands of students over the decades, not just to the likes of Cicero and Machiavelli and Marx, but also Defoe and Balzac and Flaubert. His superb solo classes on a wide variety of topics have always been enriched by the travels you will hear about in a few minutes. From the very beginning of my acquaintance and work with Roger, I got to know the extraordinary Mandy, too. And I have had the pleasure of watching their beautiful, immensely talented daughter, Kelsey, blossom from the day she was born into the aspiring opera star that she is now. The Bochets are an exceptionally loving and supportive family, and they have enormous joie de vivre. They absolutely savored their life together. They laugh a lot, and they all keep very, very busy with their current projects and with planning the next one. There are costumes and props and scripts all around, as Mandy is forever putting up shows at her school. Last year, Rex Galileo, then a holiday program, and many other events during the spring. She also sings in her rock band, The Misplaced Priorities. Her brother is sitting there. And I listen to her group, um, her, her great CD, uh, whenever I take a long drive. 
In addition to his work at OTSI, Roger publishes a newsletter called Insight into Democracy with some of the most lucid and intelligent political commentary that one can find anywhere. And he does the planning and the travel arrangements for the family trips that you will hear about in a few minutes. Reading widely about the history of each part of the world they visit, figuring how to get to places way off the beaten track with him in a wheelchair. Although I've not physically been along on any of their voyages, I have over the years spent lots of time in their home, a place of energy, humor, warmth, and beauty, where I often feel like I'm journeying with them vicariously. This is because all around the house are fascinating things that they have brought back from their travels. Mandy says they go with two suitcases and return with five. <laughs> and she always takes boxes and tubes for transporting these stunning mementos. A solitaire stone game made of Parisandre wood and polished semi-precious giant marbles from Madagascar, carved jade elephants from China, a metal hippo from one of the 26 African countries that they have visited, made from tin cans and bottle tops, a big paddle from the Polynesian island of Rarotonga, a large hollow sphere with a delicate filigree pattern carved from a solid piece of wood, an orange shawl given to Roger by a Buddhist monk who was so deeply moved by the effort he had made to climb and visit his holy place. The shawl was a precious heirloom in the monk's family, for it had been blessed by the former Dalai Lama. The monk insisted Roger take it. The Boucher's walls are festooned with carvings and pictures from all over the world, beautifully crafted weavings, paintings of giraffes from Zanzibar, um, farm scenes made at an art compound of orphaned women in Vietnam, Textiles depicting zebras, dancers, and flying fish cover the pillows, the quilts, hang over doorways, and decorate windows. They have brought these magical things back on airlines the rest of us have never heard of. <laughs> and through the private guides that Roger lines up for them, they get to talk to the inhabitants and know these places because they don't flit in and out as tourists. They stay a while. They return. They follow changes over time. They go back again. Bali, India, China, over and over. This past year, after spending time in parts of Mongolia, then Beijing, and then Tibet for another return visit, about which I'm sure they will now tell you more, Mandy casually reported, then we went to Bangkok for a couple of days, which is always fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about that. I mulled it over. I wondered how many of us here tonight have been to Bangkok at all. How many can say it is always fascinating? <laughs> well, it turns out that our intrepid travelers have been there not twice, not three times, but four times. Some of you are fortunate enough to receive the Boucher's newsy, funny, and illustrated Christmas letter which generally comes around Valentine's Day. <laughs> As they prepare it each year, sifting through all the photos they've taken to capture their amazing experiences, it must indeed be hard to decide what to highlight. In typical banter, these letters almost always start out with, this is not the picture Roger wanted us to use. <laughs> One of the few exceptions, of course, was the year that they all agreed the picture should be of the three of them taken in the Oval Office with President Obama, one of Roger's many adoring former students. Well, right now, we will see some pictures that are Roger's favorites, some that are Mandy's favorites, some that are both of their favorites, and we will hear the stories that go along with them. So as we welcome these two terrific people, all we have to do is sit back and enjoy a great trip. Bon voyage. It will be. 
and the women's restroom is on that side of the hall, and the men's restroom is on that side of the hall. And so please come and go as you, whatever would make you most comfortable. Uh, feel free to stretch your legs or whatever you need to. Uh, if some people are being coming in late, and you know, it's family. So, Roger, I'll let you start. Well, we want to thank Jorge. Um, Jorge Gonzalez is dean of the college, and next year he's going to be president of Kalamazoo. Um, I'll We'll miss I want to thank my good friend Nina Gelbart. She's the best research, researcher I know. Um, we want to thank Carolyn Adams. Um, without her, this wouldn't have happened. Um, I'm convinced she's the most beloved person on campus. <laughs> I also want to thank the Department of Theater and all the time and work that they put in and all the help they give us. They did it, of course, for this event that they've done it for Mandy and all the holiday shows that have been done in Thorn Hall. So give a round of applause. I've also wanted to say for a long time now, I'm, uh, to a large group of people. Don't you think Mandy is just extraordinarily beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> so let's go. All right. Well, um, a lot of you have seen this probably more than the times that you want to. And it was funny, Carolyn Adams uh, asked us in October whether we would give a talk. Um, I wasn't quite sure what, she you know, travels or something. Oh, okay. And then she said, oh, could we interview you for the Austin Dance Hall? And then we sort of promo for it. Sure, of course. Um, then we said a lot of things. And to our astonishment, they printed everything we said. <laughs> I was like, I'm amazed. Put every picture. I just showed them. That's just the way we are. This is what we do. These are this our life. And, um, and then they put us on the cover in our, in our wedding. <laughs> Dark. So anyway, pretty spectacular, and I want to shout out to everybody who worked on this. So certainly a great honor. But when I was talking to Carolyn about a month ago, I said, "Okay, so we're gearing up. We scanned some pictures. You know, we tore apart some scrapbooks, and we're ready to show something. What is the talk? I mean, what do you look at, Carolyn? It's your fault that we're here. I mean, what what is the talk?" And she said, "It's all of it, Mandy." And I said, and "What is all of it, Carolyn?" She said. It's the whole inspirational story. Okay. All right. Okay. So anyway, we're going to do our best to realize that dream of hers. Uh, we hope everybody stays awake and is interested in the whole inspirational story. So here we go. Um, Roger, and these are my parents. I go to La Cañada, my adorable parents. And this is my adorable family. And this is, these are Roger's adorable parents. He probably tells Oklahoma. And this is his adorable family, many of whom surprised him tonight in Journey here. So adorable. Wow. And so now they're turned out. Oh, they can't even believe it. I work at the Weaver's School in Pasadena, and I direct plays. A bunch of people in this picture are here. And I do sing in my brother's rock band, as Nina said, the misplaced priorities. And Roger plays bridge with his brother a couple of times a week. What kind of, how are you doing there, Roger? What kind of hand is that? Looking at my cards, I'd say we have no chance. Okay. <laughs> and Roger does write his political newsletter to anybody who wants to subscribe. Just contact him through email, and he'll put you on the list. And um, when we first moved here, um, I directed in the Hillside Theater, and here I'm directing a production of Jam Yankees, and so these are my favorite ball players. If anybody who knows Roger, these are his. <laughs> um, that's what Roger looked like his freshman year at Stanford. Thank you. <laughs> this is the way I look my freshman year at Stanford. <laughs> And um, here we are at our wedding in La Cañada. Some of them are here. Yeah, exactly. A bunch of you were there. Um, this is Roger uh, when he first started teaching at Occidental. And some of us, you haven't seen us like this. 
But when I married Roger, um, we backpacked. We camped. This is Yosemite. We hiked and camped at Mount Rainier. Uh, we did stuff. We built stuff, and we did all the tune-ups on our car. <laughs> and Roger came from a golfing family. They had golfing vacations. They golfed at their local club um, all throughout the summer. His childhood was on the golf course, and here he is at Pebble Beach. No Roger. And here he is 50 years later. Yeah, this is um, St. Andrews. St. Andrews. It's a beautiful town in Scotland, and it's a university town. It's fabulous. And this is the 18th hole of the course. There's several courses now, but in 1962, I had a memorable day there golfing with my brother Phil and my dad. And when we were first dating in the early years of our marriage, Roger has uh, arthritis, which had been diagnosed in when he was about 16 years old, um, was in remission. And uh, he wanted the cane, he had surgeries, no lip, he was good. We played a lot of baseball. And here we are uh, on Mount Cook. We landed on this glacier, and here we are smooching. <laughs> and after a while, uh, Roger's knee started bothering him a lot. Things started hurting. And so he was walking with a cane. And then pretty soon, the lovable red chair, which was a pulled out thing, didn't stop us. It's just he needed to stop more often and take a load off his legs. And so here we are in Rio, and then in Machu Picchu. And pretty soon, we graduated to the gray chair, which had more stability and was more compact. And uh, here is Kelsey, our daughter, in uh, Moscow, and in at Victoria Falls. And wait, I should say you've never had lots of falls. Those are those pitiful water coming out. <laughs> Victoria Falls. Glossy Falls, Victoria Falls, they're never falling. Trip, trip, trip. They all look the same. They don't want somebody in your backyard to do nothing. <laughs> Spend all that money. Um, and then pretty soon you were traveling with a wheelchair. Here we are. Wait, that's that's in Mali. That's the ball, our favorite guy. Guy. And Roger initially. Um, could use crutches, but Roger's arthritis has been really hard on all of his joints, and so pretty soon he was using what are called, called forearm crutches here, and then pretty soon he couldn't use any kind of crutches on the surgeries, and most of the surgeries that Roger had were really so complicated that he had to go out to UCLA where doctors had never done things. It was quite experimental. Roger had one of the first knee replacements, for example, that they'd done out there. And now, if anybody ever sees an x-ray of his knee for any reason, they call me, hey, look, you know, we read about the books, well, he's got one in his leg. Get over here, check this x-ray. <laughs> never really seen one. So anyway, he was sort of guinea pig as they were trying to, to uh, beautifully put him back together. But pretty soon, he couldn't use crutches, so we had scooters. And then this was a one of his more dramatic uh, surgeries. We put it on here because if you look and see to his harness, he has got wrenches taped there. Because if ever there was going to be a problem, it was my job to get him out of that thing. Really? Um, <laughs> so, so that thing was bolted. So yeah. screwed it. Screwed into his head. Anyway, they don't do it that way anymore, but because of, we were cutting edge. And Kelsey referred to it as Daddy's hat. And there we are at the faculty club. And uh, uh, we, this is one of Roger's many wonderful students. Uh, he said many, and this is just one of them. But this one, this picture we put in, because in 1979, when Roger taught the president, they were the same height. But this many surgeries and this many, um, you know, lack of bone on bone and uh, broken bones and things that have happened to him over the years um, has really cut down his height and it annoys him to no end. <laughs> One of the things that has kept Roger healthy though is that he has swum, he swims every single day. How many times? I calculated about 10,000. 10,000 times Roger throws himself in the pool and I'm not there. My, our pool man a, a, a few weeks ago said, you mean you're not there when he swims? No. Roger's not going to wait for me. He wants to swim at one. He doesn't want to wait for me at two. You know, so Roger swims at once, but now he, uh, his neck is fused. He swims with a snorkel and a mask and a floating device and we figure out how to make all that happen and I'm 
uh, nowhere near him when he throws himself in the pool to swim his laps. Um, I want you to get a good look at this because we're not going through time um, straight through the years, and I want to make sure you recognize these people because <laughs> that's me, better. that's Roger, taller, and that's Kelsey, blonder. So anyway, she's now 28. Um, so here we go, we begin. Roger with his three favorite things, his wife, his child, and the Atlanta Braves. <laughs> and Kelsey, we're live streaming, we love you Kelsey. Uh, <laughs> to Europe in order to further her opera career. And here goes Kelsey with, you know, that butterfly. We saw that. Yes, and you saw that recently. Here she is for Angelica. Here she is as Mimi in Love OM. And here she is. This was taken just outside of Corn Hall because I'm afraid I am her publicist still. Someday she'll get famous enough that I don't have to run her website. But I know I do. And this is her diva shot that I took. But that is not the Kelsey we all know. This is the Kelsey we know. <laughs> Kelsey, um, having a, a monkey look through her hair in monkey forest in Bali, Roger was horrified. He was horrified. Get those monkey off oh, and eat. It's so fun. She does it. Cause rabies. She's laughing. So the monkey is looking through her hair. <laughs> Didn't find anything and went somewhere else. <laughs> And Kelsey has gone with us on our, our trips. Um, here she is at age four in Cambodia. She's been a very good sport about meeting people. She's been a wonderful ambassador and a treasure to travel with. And so we just, the whole inspirational story, sorry you guys, uh, Kelsey in Africa. Um, Kelsey is great company. And I show you this picture in Botswana because um, Roger has a great deal of difficulty uh, getting in and out of our Santa van. It's just too high. And a lot of the vehicles that we're in are just really difficult to get in and out of. And so I show you this because there is a technique and of course Kelsey very lovingly is happy to help her father in and out of vehicles. And Roger always runs a slight fever because of his arthritis. So it's plenty hot here in Tunisia in the second largest coliseum in the world. But it's really hot for Roger so we often you know try to keep him in shape. And we do stuff. She's on a yak at 16,000 feet. She's holding bugs in Africa. She's holding snakes in Thailand. She's looking at, at, at elephants in the Ngorogoro crater in Kenya, or in Kenya. Here, she's on a Mongolian horse. Take a look at that horse. The short little legs. That is what Genghis Khan rode. The, that, that little teen thing. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay, over, you know, most of the known world. I'm sorry. Um, when Kelsey, when, <laughs> there are a few things picked up we have that if child services ever do, <laughs> things that we sometimes, you know, we were in Thailand. Of course, you don't sign anything. And when I said, is it safe? Oh, safe, 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 safe. And Kelsey's like a little, it's a real tiger. And Roger says, I had that time very easily. Give me a still, Kelsey. I'll, I'll go in with you. I did not volunteer to go in here. The time I took the picture. Fed my dog and my daughter has been doing. And here, we're is with Kelsey in the wilds of Burkina Faso with baby guys. Excuse me, but this is a sacred crocodile. <laughs> We don't find it. You only plan it. They say you can do this. They say you can touch it. They say you can touch it. It's the book's fault. That's right. So we went with the book. Kelsey touched it. And I had to say, a couple of times a week, I think about this. And I think, and how near was the nearest hospital? <laughs> the of Faso. Uh, four days? <laughs> 6,000 miles? Uh, Kelsey's been a good sport about singing on our trips. We were at a, a very remote uh, Christian church. Um, in the country of Georgia, and there was a very old woman who <coughs> clearly had a lonely life, just you know, taking donations, and not many people came to this church. And I asked Kelsey if she would sing. The acoustics were pretty, and Kelsey sang Ave Maria. And the woman got up, looking at Kelsey like this, and went over to our guy, and I thought, oh my gosh, 
done something I learned something that was impolite or or sacrilegious or disrespectful and our guide said she said that's the most beautiful thing she ever heard would she sing it again the same song it's very sweet and, and I should say that God said to me and I was going to stay in the car. This is 80 steps. You can't make it. So I had to make it. <laughs> Don't tell Roger. <laughs> As my mother used to say, some people said it couldn't be done. But he would have grinned and replied that maybe it could. But he would be one who would not say so until he tried. So he jumped right in with a hidden of a grin and he tackled the thing that couldn't be done. And over and over again, he did it. That's Roger. <laughs> Mongolian yurt. And here Kelsey is singing in a church in Malawi where some construction workers were putting it back together. Most impressively, our guide said when we were in Namibia, he had a special place where he wanted her to sing, and it was at the top of Dune 45 in Namibia, super high climb, super impossible to the sand, and I did not. <laughs> <laughs> Like <laughs> Traveling all sorts of contraptions. Here we are in a bicycle rickshaw. Um, and Roger puts us on all kinds of flying machines. Now, this one is in Ethiopia, but here, Roger will really go up at anything. I gotta say, I take three steps back at some of the things he would get on. But Kelsey on my hip and say, honey, have a safe trip. <laughs> um, so there he is in Brazil going through the rainforest. Um, this is the largest passenger plane in the world. It is the A380. It is two full stories. It makes a 747 look small. It has bedrooms and showers if you're in super duper first class being right there. And, but this is more likely to be the plane Roger puts us on. <laughs> this is one where they ask you your weight, buck naked. And then they say, add 33 pounds to that, and that's all you can take. That's your glasses, that's your shoes, that's your purse. Not a lot of shopping on those trips. Very <laughs> annoying. So Roger puts us on these planes. We get him in. And we take off. And we land somewhere like that. Lord knows where that is. And Kelsey, if she's lucky, gets to sit with a cute bush pilot. <laughs> but more often than not, they need me for ballast. <laughs> and Chelsea, in order to balance the plane, sits with the wheelchair on her lap. <laughs> or the wheelchair on her lap. Or sometimes she doesn't even get to have a lap. <laughs> this is the hall outside of Roger's office where he looks and thinks about our next trip. Some people ask us where we've been, and it's probably easiest. This has a pointer to show you on a map. And of course, we have not been everywhere. We wouldn't presume to say that when we've been to Australia, I've never been to Alice Springs, but I've been lots of places. And so, but just generally, uh, with a few exceptions of a few countries, we've been everywhere there, everywhere in South America, everywhere in Central America, everywhere in North America. We've been to Greenland, we've been to Iceland. We've been to almost everywhere in Europe. We've been almost everywhere in Asia. We've been to a lot of the Middle East. We have been, of course, Australia. They're all around there. I'm all around there. <laughs> <laughs> here, Africa is the most challenging, of course, and we have been all over the West. We have been all over the East. We've been all over the South, and we really have not done this. So, and we've never done that. <laughs> Lots of penguins, they're told. Anyway, I want to say, just by way of a disclaimer, just in case you're wondering, is Roger ever going to talk? Um, if you're wondering, that when Roger and I were organizing this talk, we typed up all the different topics, and I literally gave him the page. He said, honey, you know, fast pictures, blah, blah, blah. He said, I'll take that, and I'll take that, and I'll take that. So you're stuck with me because uh, he'll be talking soon. <laughs> Um, the next part Roger is going to talk about, but I'd like to set it up and just say that when our daughter was four, when Chelsea was four, Roger had a sabbatical at Oxy, and he was going to take us to 10 countries in Asia, 
Bangladesh, India, places we, we had, certainly haven't ever been, um, Cambodia, Nepal, um, all over Asia, 10 countries. He was very excited. Roger does plan all the trips. He plans great trips. I stay out of it. I just hope us get from point A to point B once we're on March. But in any event, Roger was very excited. And he said, man, aren't you so excited about this trip? Oh, it's going to be so, 10 countries, two months traveling. And I said, I, mean, I have to say, I am not looking forward to this trip. Not at all. Really not at all. And his face sort of fell. And I said, I, I, I'm sorry, it's just that Kelsey is poor. And she really needs to run. She's a little girl. She can't just be on my hip all the time. She needs to run, run, run. And by this time, Roger was having had had you know, a bunch of surgeries, and he was walking with difficulty. He was walking, but with difficulty. He needed to rest on the red chair or the gray chair. And so I just said, I think I'm going to be very this. And you're going to say, well, wasn't that a beautiful thing? And I'm like, well, Kelsey. And I'm like, Kelsey, mom. And I just, so in all honesty, I'm not looking forward to the trip at all because I think I'll, I'll just be worried about both of you. And Roger said, well, why don't we take an extra pair of cans? And I said, really? <coughs> really? And he said, yeah, let's let's take someone. So I just want to show you, for all the places that you saw we've been, we couldn't have gone at all if it wasn't for the next group of people that we're going to show you who are really the people who make these trips possible. So Roger? I love them all. These are our helpers. Because <laughs> one, one will help me and one will help Kelsey. All of them. Kelsey's growing up. And they both help me. Yeah, they both help me. Yeah. Um, this one is Bethany Golden and niece, and we're in Indonesia. This is Leah O'Connor, and we're in Croatia. Um, this is Brittany, who escorted some of you in, another wonderful niece. And we are in Finland. Finland. Okay. Uh, this is our my wonderful sister, sister-in-law, Paula, Manny's sister, uh, a guy who we picked up at the airport to drive us around, <laughs> and they're getting me up to the Great Wall of China, and it looked like it would be about 100 yards, and it was like more like 100 miles. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was quite a hike. Uh, this is Jim Reynolds, my nephew, and we're in uh, East Timor. And this is our wonderful niece, Missy, and we're in Iran. And this is a friend of Kelsey's, Kelly Osborne, and we're in Ukraine. And this is another friend of Kelsey's, Alana Baldwin, and we are in Fiji. And this is Casey Adams. I think she's in the audience. <laughs> Carolyn's uh, daughter. Carolyn Adams' daughter. And we took her to... Switzerland, Greece, and this is in the Seychelles. We're about to get on that helicopter. And this is Anais Borja, who was a student of Mandy's, and that's, of course, the Sphinx in Egypt. And this is Katie Weisshoff, and we're in Alaska. She was a student at Waverly and a graduate of Oxy. And this is our wonderful friend Heidi, who went to India with us. This is our wonderful friend Rosie, who went to Palau with us, and I wouldn't do that for the world. Um, there's, they're putting horrible health-giving bugs, supposedly, all over their body. It has kept us young. <laughs> we paid a lot for that. Rosie Pesco. And this is the infamous Dan Curran. And you can see Kelsey gets along with him pretty darn well. We'll tell you more about Dan later, but this one happens to be an Easter here. Well, this is something that is a great treasure in our house. It is kind of a very scratchy lemur, not, not, not pleasant to touch. It's just scratchy, I think nothing. But in my living room, it is right under the picture of us in the Oval Office. And truly, if I had to run out the fire, and I had Roger out, and Kelsey out, and I'd be like, I would grab this lemur. It's that important to me in terms of being a treasure, and that's why it lives there. And several people who know this story had said, Mandy, you have got to tell the story of Madagascar. And when I, shall we go? Yeah. <laughs> and when I showed um, Brian Fitzmorris that I was going to make this bingo whack, he very nicely said, you know, Mandy, sometimes it's good to leave a picture up. And I said, look, when I know this story, I don't know what I mean. It's a big story. I just... So, first of all, when Roger set it up, I'm afraid it is a stand.
ending of kind of a story, and it is about Dan Curran, who is here tonight. Uh, so Roger, where were we going? Okay, Get it started for us. Chelsea was six years old. We were in Ethiopia. I had a wonderful time in Ethiopia. We flew to Uganda, stayed at Kampala, the capital, <laughs> and now our big overnight flight, it's going to be a really tiring flight, was to fly from Kampala to the Nairobi airport, wait six hours for the plane that would pick us up to take us to Madagascar. So the title of the story really is Getting to Madagascar. <laughs> so there we were, we were in the airport, the Nairobi airport, and we were in transit. You know, we just come from Uganda, and they said, now walk from where you've gotten off to gate number seven. So we're walking. It's very deserted. It's completely empty. Roger and Dan are doing irresponsible things, like finding long ramps to let Roger go in his wheelchair. <laughs> Dan, you know, running beside him. He's saying, I can't watch this, you guys. You don't have to do anymore. They're yucking it up. You know, good work. Anyway, so nobody is in the airport, and when we get to our gate, still nobody. Now, this is 7.47. That's coming from Paris to pick us up in Nairobi to go to Madagascar. And that plane only comes once a week. Kind of important to the story. Once a week. And we're there, and we don't know where everybody else is. We keep checking to see if it's the right gate. Nobody's there to check us in. It's a little confusing. There we are, just the you know, four of us and a man reading a newspaper. And so we're sitting there. And then someone comes and tells us that they're sorry to let us know that we won't be going to Madagascar because it turns out that somebody in Paris took 150 seats off that concern, confirmed seats off that flight and it sold them to somebody in Paris. And uh, we can't get on the flight because we don't have confirmed seats anymore, even though we did you know, two hours ago. And we're, we're not getting on the flight. And they tell us that people are literally rioting down in, 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 in the ticket around the ticket. We can't see it because we're in transit. We're just sitting there by ourselves wondering where the other 100 people are. They're getting on the flight. And they don't show up. Roger is spitting nails. You don't say no to Roger pretty much ever. Don't do it. Uh, and Roger is so mad. And and so Dan says to Roger, you don't want to catch you on that plane? And Roger said, I I do. And Dan said, Do you care what I do to get you on that plane? And Roger says, I do not. Get me on the plane. So Dan says, Come on, Andy. I'm <laughs> so I go up and I fold my hands and I'm ready. That Dan is going to give this woman the tickets because we have tickets. <laughs> I'm all ready for what Dan's going to do. And instead he says, I'm sorry, but we have got to get to Madagascar. This is my sister. Now think how nice that is. Dan is a lot younger than I am. He said I was his mother, but he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> this is my sister. Dan to get there because our brother is getting married and this wedding has been planned for over two months over two months and everybody is there and the little girl because it's <coughs> over, the, you know, when I, the little girl is the flower and i'm the best man he says and we've got to get there so i don't want to do something <laughs> 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 I mean, they, they look 15. I don't know how they really were, but they look 15, and they're expressionless. Are they to arrest us, or are they there to go on another plane? Because I don't think they're going to Madagascar. <laughs> and they sat there without much expression for, and watched the whole drama play itself out. Now, Dan doesn't seem to care about these gun-toting babies, but I'm really worried about them. Because I don't know whether they've been called into hall, come call us to jail. Dan now is in his own body, 
He is a good cop and a bad cop in one person. <laughs> <laughs> Dan is both giving them the tickets and then charming the, the, the women behind the desk. And then giving them the tickets. At one point, he is really on a roll. And he says, this is outrageous. This is outrageous. We are, we are, we are citizens. And I'm thinking, oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares what we're American doing? We're citizens. He thinks about it. Of the world. <laughs> And I'm crying. And I worry about the baby face kids, and so I say, Sixty kids 
armed with submachine guns, they stood up and applauded. <laughs> they, they could see, you know, they, maybe they could hear too, hear some of the language. They could certainly see that we wanted to get on and et cetera. And they stood up as in unison and applauded. And the second thing is, Dan is a lovable con man. And I can tell you right now, if you get captured by somebody horrible, find Dan. <laughs> I told Roger and Dan, and she said, you know, we have to leave the hotel because we may run into someone on the flight crew and they'll think we're supposed to be going to win. Oh, for Christ's sake, Danny, we are not going to do that. We're going to enjoy our day traveling. Okay. But I had told Kelsey, and she was ready to go to a wedding. To oh, 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 oh. And I said, Kelsey, I told you a terrible lie, and you can buy anything you want. <laughs> in the Antana Rebo, second largest outdoor market in the world, there wasn't much to buy. And that lemur wasn't as big as mine. <laughs> There he is. We love him. <laughs> and then the next thing that we can say about Dan, let him be that Dan for a little while. And it's this that part of the reason we can travel the way we do is that Dan does think anything's possible. And before we traveled with Dan, I had been working in a wheelchair. I would just assume he used a wheelchair like most of us see it, get used. Um, you know, all four wheels are down and we can push someone somewhere. But Dan, as you can see, that he's actually going through sand. Roger wanted to see the stars. So he just put Roger in the wheelchair, rocked it on the back wheels, and dragged him down the beach. And he always would pop Roger and put his feet up because the back wheels of a wheelchair are kind of like Sherman Tank. I mean, you know, they just go, they roll over anything. You can get the little wheel wheels out of the way. And so it was Dan's ingenuity and can do. That, that allowed us to travel when you see the way we do travel, it's Dan's technique. But the other thing is Roger. And Roger is, is very fearless. And Roger has never, in 45 years of marriage, I mean, when, if we do something like this, push him back all of a sudden because we're, we're going through crazy traffic, we've got to get through, we've got to move back roll. Wheels. Roger never says, oh, don't do that. Oh, that was scary. Or, oh, what, no, you should warn me. Or, oh, I didn't know you that. Roger never says anything. He just laughs and is happy and wants to get from point A to point B. And so because he's never bothered by what we need to do to get him somewhere, and he never goes, oof. And Dan did anything he wanted to with Roger to get him there. Learned a lot, and that's how we get Roger around. So anyway, Roger is on the back wheels. As you can see, here he is on the back wheels going across cobblestones in, uh, in Latvia. Here we are going to very difficult terrain in Africa. Here we are going down the beach, and I should say, once people got old enough, particularly Kelsey, old enough, there are usually three of us doing this. I mean, I just say this because I'm on the other side. We call it pony, and when you're in rough terrain, you really need three people. You need the person who's driving and pulling, but you need two other people who are pulling a lot, because you're going up and down hills. It takes three people. So I just dropped back for a second to take the photograph. So if you see two people in this position, I've only went for a second, I'm gonna go right back and apply my hands in order to help. And they're getting through tricky traffic in Thailand and through temples that are hard to go through. And again, his feet are way up in the air. And sometimes Roger says, let's go chase those geese. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this is what our technique is. Brittany here is got Roger back. Uh, we're in Bangkok. And Kelsey walks in front. One of us walks in front with our arms kind of wide. And um, that means that she follows close behind and anybody coming towards us has to go around Kelsey. And by the time they've gone around Kelsey, they, they go around um, Roger and Brittany. And so you can see here, these women have been forced off the sidewalk. I don't get a bad way. They're not happy. But the thing is, is that Kelsey's coming with her arms spread. And they, they can either move over or they can go to the side. But we just follow close behind. And when we're in traffic like this, I mean, this is, this is Kashgar, China. And um, Roger's in this, and this looks very dangerous, of course. No, he's a little stupid. But anyway, here we are. <laughs> and, and I would say that there, there are camels, and there are um, the herds of cattle going through. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going through there. And here, when Missy was going through Tunis, I mean, she's going through impossible crowds. But she can get through because that is what it looks like. <laughs> Kelsey and I, or whoever I'm with, one works the wheelchair on the back wheels. And the other two are shoulder to shoulder and we don't park. Nobody can go through us and they've got to go around us. Sometimes we have to stop, 
But uh, Roger's always safe in the, in the pocket. <laughs> and getting Roger into a car, uh, you can see Kelsey's got a hole under his belt. And I would say, if any of you have ever been in the hospital and you're, or somebody you've been with, it's kind of a big person, and you've got all this in a little physical therapist, you put a belt around that person. Because if you've got a hold of the center, you've got a hold of the center. And so on a count, Roger needs to do some of it. They lift, they push, sometimes his foot is out, the knee, they work their knees and gently shove it in. And sometimes we have people help, we'll just, we're in a kind of impossible situation, but there are people around, they're happy to help. This is six people uh, in Tibet. And I have to show you, this is kind of funny. That's Roger's bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I say that because this was, we've never done this before. Our, our driver was very insistent that he could get Roger up this, this ladder on his back. I was a little worried about that, I have to say. Roger was not. Like I said, Roger doesn't say, but you know, I don't want to just, uh, let's talk about how we're going to do this. But anyway, Brittany is up there, Dawa, our guy, is up there, and Kelsey is hurrying as fast as she can up the second ladder because there's nothing for Roger to sit, and he can't stand very long, really, not at all. So Kelsey's hurrying up there with the ladder up, a virtually straight ladder. Now it's time to come down, and this is so the 18. They don't need me up there. They've got Roger up on his back. Brittany has given him the wedgie of his life. <laughs> no way is she going to let go of him because she has got him. And Dawa has got him in the front. And our driver sweetly has got him on his back. I shouldn't remember his name, but I don't. Kelsey, you can see, is there getting that wheelchair and she's going to go down the others. And here we are at the Patala Palace. 1,000 rooms in the Patala Palace. And that's the it's orange bad. scarf. It's bad, excuse me. Uh, that's the orange scarf that um, uh, Nina mentioned that the monk had uh, given to Roger that had been his family for so long. But anyway, we had to get through this. Now, we hadn't gone to Tibet only because, for many years, because Roger was so anemic, um, he didn't have enough blood, red blood cells to go. <laughs> Annoyed him. And then he was put on new medicine, which gave him normal blood, and so off to Tibet. <laughs> so once he, once he had enough red blood cells to go. And um, I was worried about uh, all the stairs and, and stuff, so we got a chair from a restaurant, we got two poles, and they tied Roger in. They tied him in, and they said they were going to, they called them Sherpas, two Sherpas, we were into that, two Sherpas, Carrie and I said, I need six, and they said, two, Mandy, they carry people with weapons and all their stuff, and I get up really, and I said, you know, I need six, again, I won't have a good time. I don't want them to get tired. I don't want to worry about Roger tipping. I want, if they get tired, I want someone to spell them, so we have six. And here we go, and literally, they're taking Roger up straight ladders, up like that, through holes in the ceiling in order to short, take shortcuts. I came around the corner once, and Roger's way up there, a straight ladder, pushing up, pulling up. There's a hole up there, and I said, Roger, how you doing? It's great. <laughs> Who's carrying me up there? <laughs> anyway, so through the Patala Palace we went. And now Roger is going to talk about a trip to Ethiopia. And again, some uh, techniques that, again, Stan, come in, uh, that we learned, and then you'll see ways we apply them. Yeah. Ethiopia, this is a, this was a, it, when you travel, you get unexpected days. We didn't really expect much out of this day. I really wanted to go to a place in Ethiopia called Lalabella, where they carved a, a pretty fancy church out of rock into the ground um, in the shape of a cross. But this was a rainy season, and they didn't have, they only had a dirt runway, so we couldn't go. So we asked our guide, is there any rock carving church around here? Um, that we could go to. And he said, yeah, I think I just one about 30 miles away. And I said, great. Um, let's, let's go see that. And I figured 30 miles, maximum two hours. Um, so we start out, and, and this is the sort of thing you see in poor countries. This is one of the lessons I learned that day. And we, we couldn't find the picture that I really wanted, which was a wide road, as far as the eye could see, with no cars. No trucks, just little kids carrying water and fuel, wood, generally. And every day, they've got to go farther, a little farther, to get water and wood. And these are four-year-olds who should be in school. But 
there's no water or wood around. So that's a common sight in four countries that the kids have to wait or spend their time, really is spent, um, getting water and wood. So I learned that as we started out. And then we came to this area with uh, uh, huts like this one. And we asked our guide if we could see inside one and meet the people. And he said, sure, I actually know this dialect. We're only about 10 miles outside of Addis Ababa, but it's a dialect that most people would know, but he knew it. So we met this family. Those have to be, well, the oldest one is the daughter, the husband and, and father, or well, the parents. wife, the parents, um, are out working in the fields. And she's shaking Kelsey's hand. You see a little girl on the bottom right? She's crying uncontrollably because she's never seen a white person and she's convinced Kelsey's a ghost. <laughs> um, and so when we pulled up to their hut, you know, we were quite a, an event for them. And they were very nice. They were wonderful people. And we went in the hut. Do we have a picture of that? I can't remember. No. I don't think you do. And you could tell right away that they only burn wood in the hut and there's no ventilation. Now think of what that smog does to your lungs after living there 5, 10, 20, 30 years. It's, it was 40 years. It was, it was mind-boggling. So, and actually, if you look closely at the door in, in the back hut, um, you can see charcoal black kind of because the smoke, that's where the smoke comes out of. So they were very nice on the way back. They fried us some nuts and they gave them to us and, and you know, uh, could have been nicer. Actually, that's true all over the world. Some people said that we were going to West Africa, that it was a dangerous place or something. If you go with respect for their culture, um, they will give it right back. Anyway, we were, this, is, this was a church and we had the road washed out. Um, by the way, it didn't take it took about four hours or 30 miles. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, normally if we had Dan along, we'd say, oh, damn, I can't make it to the church. But Dan said, yes, we can. And so I said, yes, we can. And so here we are going up the hill. And that's our guide. And Dan pushing and a villager has a baby on her back. And the people up here are as nice as can be, just wonderful. And this is a very, primitive church. I can't, I tried to find on the internet where, when it was carved, I have no idea. But on this little outside area where we are, on the inside is the church. And so we go through there, and then we come out, and then we go back down the hill, and then Dan helps me down what, when I'm walking, and the guy has the wheelchair. And Dan says, yay, yeah. we made it. And we go back home. Okay, I want to urge some of you, especially students out there, um, there's a writer of the New York Times, Nicholas Kristof, who says, you haven't finished a college education until you've seen part of what used to be called third <coughs> poor countries around the world. And they have monuments. The people are more important, but they do have monuments. This is Angkor Wat, Cambodia. Go before there's an Angkor Wat Burger King. Because there will be. The whole world starting to look like the Glendale Gallery. This is Angkor Wat again. We're there with Kelsey's four with Bethany. When we were there, the only people who were really there, there were very few tourists. I mean, obviously they come through, but, but uh, there was no real way to get there on an airplane. Now they have a major airstrip and big planes can now fly in. Direct we're staying in very... We were staying in a crazy, not so great hotel. Now they have five star hotels, four stars. It's a beautiful place. Um, when we were there, all these children were there. This is where the villager kids hung out there, just looking at Kelsey, just looking at them. Um, I think you can't get even that close. Uh, you have to sort of be bused to a place nearby. So things are changing. It is, it's, it's, things are getting wait, more and more discovered. Wait, wait. <clears throat> Angkor Wat, a Hindu kingdom from roughly 800 to 1200. Uh, this is Bagan in, in Myanmar, Burma. Um, 
It's a thousand stupas. I love stupas. They're so beautiful. A stupas uh, become fancier and fancier as the years go by, but it's supposed to be a mound around some relic of the Buddhas. In Sri Lanka, we saw one that supposedly had a tooth. Um, as far as you can see, there it is. you can see these stupas. They're hard to climb, but I can climb one. It's my favorite monument in the world. It's called Bora Badur. Ninth century. It's built, it's on the island of Java in Indonesia. And you can see it here from the air. And you can see that you're going to go around it sort of in circles. And each circle, you're going to go a little higher. Now, along the walls, starting at the bottom wall, it shows the first premise of Buddhism, which is life is suffering. And then you start up toward enlightenment. And then first you can't see, you have to have faith you'll get there. And as when you finally get to the top, well, here's the Buddha who's achieved enlightenment. And all these smaller stupas are bodhisattvas who are, um, who are able to be a Buddha and leave this world, but instead they stay back to help the rest of us. Uh, I just want to, we just want to show you this monument, this fabulous monument in Syria, it's a beautiful country. I remember so sadly being in Damascus, the people were so nice, and this woman said to me, maybe the world would be more peaceful now that George Bush is elected. <laughs> uh, how long you uh, but if you can see this, this is an ancient Roman city built on a Greek model. Um, in front of you is the religious area, and it's pretty much been torn down by ISIS now. As you see diagonally, there's a road, and there used to be uh, uh, an arch. The Romans knew the arch. They didn't, um, the Greeks only imposed in lentil construction. And then way at the top right-hand corner is a crusader castle, probably built 1150, something like that. So tremendous monuments around the world. Right. Probably the most significant parts of it have been blown up by now. <laughs> Okay, I, Mandy asked me, will you explain why we travel? And I said, okay, I'll do my best. So this is from Max Weber's, uh, one of his books. He's a great sociologist, philosopher, economist, everything. And he said, the, the universe, or just take the earth, without humans is infinitely meaningless, because there are no humans to give it meaning. So now it's people with humans, and in different parts of the world, they give it different meanings. They're not all religious meanings, but that's part of it. Sometimes it's a military meaning, Sparta. Sometimes it's an uh, intellect meaning, Confucian scholars, you know, over and over. Um, but we like to go to the different cultures and nations that have carved out and made their own meaning of the world, they made sense of the world for themselves. That alligator that Kelsey touched, or crocodile that Kelsey touched, is part of an animist religion where you sacrifice a chicken, we bought a chicken and it got eaten, and then your wish comes true, your, your mother gets better if she's healthy or something, I mean she's unhealthy. <coughs> so um, we like to see, we're so curious about the different meanings that creative people, intelligent people around the world have, have, made, have given to their world and made sense of it. It's an obvious one to us in the West. This is St. Peter's, of course, at the Vatican. This is in Lithuania. It's called the Hill of Crosses. There, there are literally hundreds of thousands of crosses in the middle of nowhere. And I, well, it's pretty obvious it's a Christian monument. This is a Buddhist monument. Um, this is in, in Tibet, these people, this is a very holy place, and these people are prostrating themselves all the way down, hands, um, face, etc. Here's Brittany turning um, the prayer, prayer wheel. This is a mosque in Lahore, Pakistan, and here is Missy. Because I had to take off my shoes to go in the mosque because she's putting my shoes back on. People praying to Mecca. And you'll find this in Islamic countries. 
um, somewhere in your hotel room, either here on the lampstand between the beds or on the ceiling even. It's a, the direction of magnet, the direction you need to correct. Um, we had a wonderful time. This is in Madurai, India in the south. And these, this, these are Hindu temples, of course. Um, we happened to arrive there um, with our good friend Heidi, um, Diwali. And Diwali's like their 4th of July, New Year's, Easter, all rolled up into one. And we sat on a hill, drank wine, and listened to the fireworks. Just like nothing you've ever heard. This is Varanasi, where people go into the Ganges to bathe, and they, and they also float the ashes of their loved ones. And we like to eat, and things are so beautiful. Marketplaces all over the world, we like to go into markets, so food, we like to eat. Roger tends to have that look on his face. Whenever we are in a foreign place, we, uh, Dan and Kelsey and I are very excited about trying injera in uh, Ethiopia, not so much. Roger and I are a little worried about haggis in uh, Scotland. Now, <laughs> you know, there we were, Iceland, and that's what it's called in Iceland. So I went up and I said, um, Can I have some crap, please? And they said, Cherry or blueberry? <laughs> Cherry crap, please. <laughs> And then when we were in Kazakhstan, this is a laundry detergent. I don't think this is going to be big in the United States. Can you let me take your picture in front of that ad? Here we are in India, drinking wine, water. And my mother's name is Zelta. And they made Zelta beer in Estonia. And these are crowded marketplaces where you sell that's, kinds of things. That's in Marrakesh in Morocco. Uh, this man pulls tea for a living. Oh. Looks like popcorn. That's not popcorn on this table. It's raw tea. Oh. This man eats glass for a living. These people are in Mali. No, no, in Mopti, in Mali. And you've got to rethink your, your, your own thoughts when you're in these poor countries. Because if, you, if you're going to build something and you want 100 nails, you go to the hardware store and you pay five bucks and you get 100 nails. Nails aren't so easily made, actually. And these are people in Mopti who make a living off extracting nails from dilapidated buildings, straightening them if they have to. There's even a burning furnace there probably to help straighten. And that's how they make a living. And look at this in India. This, this, these people are probably wealthy. They have their own land. They have two oxen. It's a man or woman, I assume, husband and wife. But boy, that's hard work to make a living like that. And here they're turning millet in, in West Africa and storing the grain for the, the season. And tea farms and people harvesting tea. In, in southern India. And here is, are the famous um, uh, uh, dobies. dobies of uh, Mumbai in India, washing clothes. And here and are... In India, if, if you're born into a caste, Adobes are clothes washers. It's a low cast by definition because clothes are soil. And I would say up until recently, you were born in that cast, you stayed in that cast, you died in that cast. Now, not in the countryside, but in the cities, there's probably a little more upward mobility. But the British, the Christians, the Muslims, the Sikhs, all tried to get rid of the caste. <coughs> And it won out every time. But I think urbanization will win out this time. This is in Mali, people washing um, clothes. These are people from Burkina Faso, no, from Mali, washing um, in the Cote d'Ivoire. This is Roger's favorite picture because he took it. I used to take pictures, and she's quite beautiful with her baby. And uh, this is Dan and Chelsea in the outfit that we bought from her. I could be in there and Roger too. It was really big, <laughs> very cute. And the people in Africa, they just have these breezy clothes. They're not, they're not wearing bras. It's so breezy and comfortable. And we're wearing our dumb clothes, and they look so darn comfortable. So when we were invited to someone's house, everybody's comfortable. And so we went to Taylor's and we bought some cotton fabric and then we ran around like that <laughs> and had them make us some clothes. 
And things people often ask us, you know, what is your favorite country? Do you have a favorite country? We've been over to, to over 120, um, many of them more than once. And um, really, it's India. And we would go again. We've been three times, and we would happily go again. India is is just delicious. Everything about it. The, I think the people are the most beautiful people in the world. That's my opinion. Um, they're beautiful. They, they are, their clothes are beautiful. Their, their, their transportation is beautiful. Their culture is fascinating. Religion is fascinating. The people are, are born. It, 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 I just love India. We just do. And that's these are what the trucks look like in India. That's what the trucks look like in Pakistan. <laughs> this is traffic in, uh, in probably Pakistan. Probably Pakistan. It could be anywhere in India. Um, Kelsey is next to, this is a peanut. You know, don't drive too fast and don't corner too quickly. <laughs> um, there are five people, five on this motorcycle. Um, people just, they, we once met, once met a man in Paris who said his favorite country was in India. This is where we never gone. He said, because in India, you see 10 impossible things a day. And it's really true. People going about their business, doing extraordinary things to get through their day. Um, and that's what it looks like in a train station. People, that's how beautiful it is. We just get on the train. Beautiful. Um, here we are. Uh, most of these women are not even using two hands, walking with that load. Uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, watch out a little bit, because when the, when the elephant's coming through, it's coming through. <laughs> um, this was, uh, Roger was resting. Um, and Heidi and I decided to go shopping for a couple of hours, and then we spread out our treasures. Ladies, you want to go shopping in India? Let's talk. Shopping's great in India. And we shop all over the world. All over the world. And sometimes Dan and Roger uh, are tired of all the shopping. <laughs> and Dan would get, after he traveled with us, the first time he traveled with us, he was quite polite. The second time he traveled with us, he said, I'd say, let's get this. And he'd say, too heavy, you're, you're not fine. <laughs> <laughs> really, I really want it. Too heavy, man, he dressed up. We like dressing up. We get dressed up. Roger, not so much. Here we are, dressed up in Lithuania. Roger is not going to dress like an aristocrat. He's just not going to do it. But he did dress like an emperor. He did dress like this in, in Vietnam for me. We were snakes <laughs> caught in Mongolia. <laughs> we took those goofy headdresses off so we look a little better. And sometimes he suffers indignities on trips. Yeah. This is Abu Simbel in Egypt. It's down. Um, very south, it got moved so the Asmon Dam could fill up. Um, it's close to Sudan, which I just noticed is open for travel. I'm trying to persuade Manny to go there. <laughs> Dan's already on board. I don't know who else. Um, it's, this, is, this was built by Ramesses II in the 1200s BCE. And it's roughly the time that historians can depict the Hebrews living, leaving. They don't have all the stuff about the Red Sea, but they left Egypt. Um, so it has a grand, a grand sort of area in there that they use as a museum. And you, it's easy wheelchair access. And in there they had wooden floors. It was great. And there are preserved, pretty well preserved paintings, even though they're 2,200 years old, on the wall. And Kelsey was, uh, I think, 11 here. And maybe 12. <laughs> And she was pushing me around, it was a very easy push, and we were looking at the paintings together, and um, a woman came up to Kelsey and said, my dear, that is so nice of you to push around your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I like my hair cut. It's a beautiful girls, they like some short. In this picture, it's funny, Roger and I were trying to decide what stories to cut out, and really, you're not hearing all of them. I know you feel that way, but we did cut a lot out. And Roger said, we should cut out this story, I'll tell you. And I said, no, you can't tell cut out that story. It's a good story. We're keeping it. Bethany was with us. Kelsey's four years old. She's fast asleep in her arms, and we are in Kathmandu. And we are staying at the Yak and Yeti Hotel. <laughs> it turns out that at the Yak and Yeti, we are the only tourists there, because everybody else there is on a film crew 
for a movie called The Little Buddha. And so underneath our door every day is the, you know, they just do it under everybody's door, is the, you know, filming, you know, get on the bus, that's it, blah, 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 da, 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 <laughs> record it this time, in Jamaica, et cetera. And every day we do these things. What Bethany says to me, Keanu Reeves is staying in this hotel. <laughs> now this is 1992, long before the Matrix. And I said, who's that? And she said, Keanu Reeves, he did Ted and Bill's Excellent Adventure. And I said, really? I never saw it. She said, I said, is he famous? She said, yeah, he's famous. He's famous. And how do you spell Keanu? Kind of famous, so anyway, I'm asking these questions. Well, Bethany, the next four days, she's got makeup on because she may be running back Keanu Reeves. So Bethany's looking hot for four days in a row. Can't go out on the street. So just pull herself together, blown her hair dry. So one day, we're in a bookstore. And Bethany goes, yeah, that's Keanu. And I said, what guy over there? She said, yeah. I said, you sure? She said, yeah, that's sure. Really? Good looking guy, young, dark hair, dark eyes. I said, are you sure that's Keanu Reeves? She said, yeah. And I said, and you want to talk to him? I'd like to meet him. Okay, you're done. She said, what are you going to do? I will handle this. And grace, but be ready because Keanu Reeves is going to be talking to you in just a couple of minutes. <laughs> so I go over, I've got Kelsey on my on my hip, and you know, and I'm near Mr. Reeves, and so I go and I say, I'm sorry, do you speak English? <laughs> and he looks up. Yes, I do. Oh, do you work here? <laughs> no, I don't. Well, but have you been in the bookstore before? Yeah, I have. Could you do me a favor? My niece over there, she can't find anything. She's got to buy some presents. We've got a plane today. I had to go over here in the children's section. Right over there, in the striped shirt. Do you mind? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so these are just quick, rapid fire places that we've been. This is a Wabudubu, the capital. This is the prestigious sign. Uh, for a while to do the capital of Burkina Faso. Kelsey's straddling the uh, uh, equatorial line in Ecuador. Oh, go ahead. Jim Reynolds doing the moonwalk outside of a park in Brunei, the place of Michael Jackson being paid $17 million in order to celebrate the Sultan of Brunei, then the richest man in the world at the time, uh, 50th birthday. Here we are in Mongolia. This is this huge monument to Genghis Khan, and you can literally climb up in the main and just see, see, see the whole world practically, the curve of earth. This is what it looks like. Rice paddy, beautiful in Indonesia. This is what it looks like. In, I mean, I have travel experience because of Cameron. In all honesty, my hands are pretty busy. We're, we're sort of helping Roger, and we're all having a good time, and, and I'll take a lot of pictures, and I certainly don't. I mean, this is iPhone stuff, fast, but it's just pretty. Um, there they are going in uh, to the waters in Cancun. This is the largest mud structure in the world, the Jenna Mosque in Mali. Mali. And here we are at Parthenon. Casey okay, again. Uh, here we are at the base camp of Everest. Um, it wasn't a clear day, but we know what's behind there, and I know because I have a friend named uh, Steve who was standing there in October and had a crystal clear picture that he sent me from that. Wait, this is the. North Base Camp, the one most people go to and get carried out by shirts and stuff and it's all trashed up, is the South. But this one is where George Mallory made his um, efforts at Everest and died in 1924. It's very high. We all look up. Uh, 17,000. But getting Roger up 16, 17,000 feet, anyway, whatever it was, to this spot, we are all a little out of breath. Um, this is a sunset in Timbuktu. <laughs> and once we had a babysitter from uh, Oxy who was vegetarian, of course, which is fine. But it dawned on me when I delivered two hamburgers uh, that my, she might be vegetarian and she was. So we had to go out and um, Kelsey said to, <laughs> Kelsey did a little, very little, she said to this a babysitter, um, you're not going to eat your hamburger? And this, this girl told us the story. She said, no, I'm a vegetarian. I'm, I'm not going to eat that hamburger. And Chelsea says, you know, if you're not a good eater, my mom won't take you on trips. <laughs> <laughs> she always says, you're not going to 
supply that food. You need a dryer. Whether it's camel or rat, if you want, you <laughs> can care. You can certainly eat all of those. You know, everything tastes like chicken and stewed and onions and tomatoes. Everything's good. So anyway, so she says, uh, and this girl says, well, uh, and she you have to you have to try things. And Chuck said, the woman said, if I if I told you you should hop on your foot and go to Timbuktu, who would you say that? And Chelsea said, I've been to Timbuktu. <laughs> <laughs> and the babysitter said, I think she's the only child I've ever been in such a place. So what was sweet about this is that we were on camel, we were going out, it's beautiful, we're in the Saharas, and Roger came up with a great idea. He found out that it was a moonless night in Timbuktu, and you're nowhere when you're in Timbuktu, really nowhere. And um, so he hired a, a vehicle to take us way out in the Sahara and to just lie in the cool sand and look at the universe. I've never seen stars like that. People, we are so impotent. <laughs> wow! That is nothing! <laughs> it was really special and, uh, and so beautiful. Roger uh, in St. Petersburg. Uh, Kelsey in Mauritius. Uh, with family in Japan, uh, in Istanbul, in West Africa, in Iceland. Uh, you are at the root of the world when you're in Tibet. You know, when you're in Los Angeles, and I mean, I, first of all, I'm sure you guys all travel a lot, and I hope this doesn't sound, you know, I hope this isn't boring or even something <coughs> that it's not intentional. But I know when I was in the clouds in Los Angeles, they're up there. It would never be happen. They're up there. And in in Tibet, they're like right here. <laughs> I mean, they're so high in Tibet, just like right there. Um, here we are in, uh, in the Maldives. I have, Roger said I should tell you this. We were, we, were, we were in our hotel room in the Maldives. And I'm talking to Roger, and all of a sudden I realized I see two life vests, life vests, in our, in our, we're at the Four Seasons, and they're life vests in our, in our bedroom. <laughs> and I asked one of the people who worked there, I said, so interesting, um, why do we like this? He said, well, we're not very high. There are only eight feet between sea level and the highest point on the island. And when there was that huge earthquake in Indonesia, where it killed so many people in Indonesia, and it went across and killed so many people in Sri Lanka, it passed by the Maldives too. Tsunami. He's, pardon? Tsunami. Tsunami. He said that he was in an exercise room talking to someone, and he looked at the water, beautiful picture, I looked at the water, beautiful picture, and also realized the water was going up the window. No kidding. Wow. So they go running out, they take the children, they put them on the second floor. They don't know how high that way is getting. They find, get all the, the, the guests to the reception area, which was eight feet. That's why they have life vests. And that, it wasn't a tsunami. It just, you know, what the train was like, it just rose. Said for eight hours it was about ten feet high, higher. That that went over. They all got in boats. And it went away. We enjoyed the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, glad to know it. Glad to know where they are. Um, here we are in Sri Lanka. The girls, you know, when you haven't ridden a horse for a while and you ever lay that light on it, it hurts. It's really wide on it. <laughs> Those girls can hardly walk. Anyway, they were washing the elephant, and then the elephant washed them. <laughs> and we're at the southern, southwesternmost point of the African continent. We watch bears uh, uh, and salmon fight it out to try grizzly to see whether the salmon, grizzly bears with the salmon can get past them in order to spawn. We happened to be in Kenya. We were so lucky during the Great Migration, uh, which happens you know, once a year, and off with all the wildebeest and all the zebras, and all the predators are really happy to follow all the herds along. Uh, Nicaragua, Mongolia, Kelsey has her lightsaber out, because this is in Tunisia, and it is where they filmed the first Star Wars uh, bar scene, filmed right in there. Um, Sometimes, like I said, Roger Mike, he's much braver than I am. Much braver. I, I go up on these trips, but when we get in a boat like this with we'll, that many people, and we go out onto a lake to go look at hippos, a river, and, a river to look at the hippos, and I see them. They're right over there. I'm good. They're right over there. Good, good, good. Mind you, can we go closer? Honey, we're good. And one of the guys says, "Okay," and the other guy, "No." Mind you, let's go closer. One guy, "Yeah." I am straddling the tectonic plates. I'm in 
Iceland, the great Eurasian tectonic plate, and the, and the um, American tectonic plate. No earthquake, please. <laughs> All right, it's my turn. Um, in 1996, Kelsey was eight. We went to Central America, and this is in Belize. And we got there, and we learned right away that there was a, a place, a reef, um, out on the ocean where you could swim with sharks and rays. And Dan and I were so excited, we hardly couldn't hardly sleep. So Dan is, Dan is doing what he normally did very kindly getting me in my gear, you know, whatever I need to snorkel and, you know, pet the sharks and stuff. And then he, all of a sudden I, I realized he just shoved me into the water because he's so eager to get in there himself. And he gets in, Kelsey gets in, no problem. And man, he's still on the boat. Kelsey, get in! I'm photographing! No, get in! You're just afraid. Well, I'm photographing! Get in the water, man! And they're feeding moray eels down there. I mean, what do people Yeah, there, I saw two moray eels, big ones. One that fed another I saw it was a green one. And um, I saw my daughter grab hold of the tail of one of the five-foot sharks. And I could see her heading out to the bigger sharks. Save, save, save. <laughs> Save's fishy. Yeah, the next day we... Um, we're in Belize still, and Dan said, I, can I have a day off? Because I want to go um, dive the Blue Hole, which is either in Honduras or Belize, they dispute. And we said, all right, I, mean, I think he thought we'd just sit around and work on our tans. We hired a guide to take us fishing. So we went out and first we're catching, this is a trigger fish, and later we caught, um, yeah, I'm laughing. Later we caught barracuda in, in the mangrove. Um, we caught 30 fish. Kelsey caught 17, I caught 10, 11, and Mandy caught two. Uh, yeah, you think, well, poor Mandy, but the fact is she reeled in 30. Because I couldn't with my arthritis reel them in. And Kelsey was only eight, so it was, Mom, help, Mom, Mandy, help, Mandy, help. Here we are in Palau. We went to Palau because we were told that it was the most beautiful snorkeling in the world. And that's why we went. And we went with our friend, Billy Mestel, and it was just, it's incredibly beautiful in Palau. And I mean, this is, you're just going around, uh, you know, these beautiful islands as you're speeding through, everything's beautiful. This is Homer Simpson <coughs> Island. This is the one that, you know, on the couch, going on. Uh, you know, that's so funny, and that's what they call it. And where we were going to was Jellyfish Lake. Now, Jellyfish Lake didn't used to be a lake. It used to be part of the ocean. You could see over there to the right. But there was an earthquake a gazillion, gazillion years ago, and it collapsed. And so these, these jellyfish, um, over time, they evolved with no stingers. They didn't have predators. And so there are literally millions of jellyfish in this lake. And when we got there, our guides, I mean, we thought we were going to Jellyfish Lake. We didn't know what it looked like, but we were going there. And they told Roger to stay in the boat because there was no way Roger could get through the jungle up over the mountain in order to get to Jellyfish Lake. Well, Roger wasn't going to stay in the boat. Well, this is what this is, I mean, this is kind of incredible. Here Roger is starting off. There's no footing. There's no way for Rosie and me to help. These two men can hardly help Roger because it's so difficult. So they take off and they take off. And it's really impossible. And um, uh, we finally get there, yay, and there's Roger. I mean, I just had a piece of junk camera shooting at Roger. Jellyfish are that plentiful. I'm just right down beneath me. That's how many jellyfish there are. Roger's up there. I just swung down in order to take a picture of the jellyfish, and then it's time to go back. And it was really, it was really Foolish, probably. <laughs> it was worth it. It, it. it reminded us of the time we were in Ghana, and uh, they said Roger couldn't go walk up to the canopy of the rainforest. It was way too difficult to walk. We had a great chair. So anyway, we got there, we got there, we got there, and we got there, we got to this. Now, this is a force of perspective, so you can't quite see what it looks like. 
Um, Kelsey is on a board that is about that wide. And there's seven of these. They're just really, really, really long. Roger would have gone across all of them. He's very brave. But he, he, he you only have one adult on and he was walking across. They're dangerous. Anyway, I mean, it's just, you know, they made this thing, but it's not, two, two adults cannot be on it at once. It actually was so brave by the time she went across two of these that you can't even see the ground and you are above the canopy, um, that she went back to Roger. Well, I was determined to do all seven. And I gotta say, I didn't look at a bird. I didn't look at a piece of fruit or a flower. I was so scared. I went and set across those seven bridges that were so long. And what you couldn't see is they're only this wide and you can't see the net. You, you really can't. It's, you, know, you just see nothing. It's, it's there, but you can't see it. So anyway, so I'm getting across this thing. By the time I get to the end of that second, I can really walk. I can't breathe, and I'm so scared, and my legs are so badly cramped. And I asked the guy, I said, I am so ashamed. Can I sit down for a little bit? Because I don't think I can walk. <laughs> and my legs are so, my legs are so scared. And he, I said, Does, do people just walk across that? He said, oh, heavens no. 40, only 40% of the tourists who come up here actually go on one of the bridges. They don't. They take a look at this, we're not crossing that. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to feel better. And then he said, and of those 40%, most don't make it. They get halfway out. They sit down and start to cry. <laughs> sit down and start to cry. They crawl. <laughs> I was really much better. This is the scene of the only accident we had. This was a bad accident that we had on this trip. Uh, we were in Sri Lanka, and the floor of our hotel was had been painted with a very glossy, glossy paint. And um, I was in the next room when Roger fell. And when he fell, he had just put his socks on, actually for traction. But he put his socks on, and his feet went out from underneath him like, like ice, like banana peels on ice. It was awful. And I heard the sound of his head cracking on this concrete floor. And so we hurried, and we got him to the nearest hospital in way of Wearsville, um, Sri Lanka. There were nice doctors. Um, there was one x-ray machine, and they, um, uh, after taking an x-ray, assured us that Roger was... Um, well, I think it was, it was their best opinion. Their best opinion <laughs> was that Roger was going to be okay, that he had, I mean, his big fear, of course, was that he was bleeding inside his brain and had cracked his brain open so horribly. And it is true that when Roger was lying on the ground, he's in our room with a can of Pepsi, as cold as I could find, um, on his head where we're all ran, running around, um, he said that he hurt his leg. And yet, when we got to the hospital, he refused to let me talk about his leg. Honey, we need to tell the doctors. No, it's, there's nothing wrong with my leg. Honey, you said your leg hurt. No, no, no. You know, my head's fine. Let's go home. I just need rest. You want to go home? Are we going back to Los Angeles? No, we're not. We're not. I just need a rest. So we, and the next morning, he said, let's go on a nine-hour trip to go see an ancient civilization. <laughs> we did. His leg was up. We put ice on it, and we went, and we saw carved Buddhas, and we saw beautiful things, and we saw an elephant orphanage, and they <coughs> went through the town, and then they ran down to the river, and it was quite beautiful as we watched. Well, that was very beautiful, but Roger was getting a lot less beautiful as the trip went on. And even worse than his face was this, which is that that bruise on his leg goes all the way up to his hip and all the way down to his foot. And I would photograph it, and we went to a sea. By this time, we left Sri Lanka. We're in Bali. And we went to a sea, a doctor, because that can't be good. That kind of a that can't be good. You know, what's going on in there? And Roger says, eh, I just, you know, I've done this sort of thing before. Roger, I remember when he was like, oh, it's nothing. You know, things hurt on me all the time. It's nothing. Really, well, it don't look so good. Well, the doctor looked at it, and she decided that we had to fly home um, with his leg up. And of course, Singapore Airlines was going to charge us $14,000 per person for us to do that. No doctor's letter was going to be good. So when we were in Singapore, we went to the hospital. They gave me shots. I kept giving shots in his stomach as we were going to pick up blood. And we got home. And when we got home, he didn't want to leave because he said, look at our hotel. Are you kidding me? Why would we leave Paradise? And I said, why would we? <laughs> We uh, had fish massages, which has never happened. They're quite this wonderful. Is this is in Bali. They eat the dents get up your feet. <laughs> and I turned this off just because Roger's leg got worse. Uh, at one point, we were at the Almondson Theater. Um, he had to complain when we had to walk down a few stairs to our seats. He turned to me um, during the show. We literally were in the third row. People tap dancing in front of us. And he said, my leg 
the story told me. And I said, all of a sudden, he said, all of a sudden, how much? I can hardly breathe. Your leg hurts that much? Like, you just walked here. It's agonizing. Do we need to go? Uh, no. And we were hiding. And we literally carried him to his wheelchair. And he couldn't put any weight on that leg. And we went and had x-rays. Nothing wrong with the leg. Maybe the artificial knee. Maybe, I mean, artificial knee, maybe artificial knee. What is it? Couldn't figure it out. And for a year, this would happen. He would be OK. And then all of a sudden, something would happen, and that leg would be agonizing. We'd go see another doctor. We would get x-rays. What's wrong with that leg? And then one day, I went to my sister Paula, and we were having dinner. And she said, I think you should see Simone. And I said, who is Dr. Smog? She said, no, Santa Monica Orthopedic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Smog. And we went and we met Dr. Earhart, who took the history and blah, blah, blah. And he took a set of x-rays. He said, well, I see the problem. You've got all these x-rays, and it's true they don't show the problem, but none of them took it from this angle. This is the angle. He puts up the x-ray, and here's your femur, everybody. <clears throat> femur goes like that. Well, Roger's femur was broken like that and was like that. And we take a good look, may I show you, at Roger's knees. One is here and the other is here. And that's because that femur is full size and this one is still broken like that. And that leg is that, is that short. So they're not going to perform a surgery on Roger. The doctor, no one's going to do that. He's way too complicated that surgery anymore. And he is, he is. Um, and so the doctor says, okay, this is what we're going to do. I know it hurts a lot. Um, you're going to try to stay off it in a name, but stimulate bone growth a little, walk a little, um, and let's just see whether those bones will knit together like this, you know, because the reason they hurt is that every once in a while they'll just break again, and now you've got a badly broken leg again, and yeah, that hurts. And then they kind of go back together and break it. So he said, let's just really stay off it, and we'll see you in two months. Okay. So Roger stays off it, and he's pretty soon, it's, it's feeling better, and, and we go see the doctor, and he says, yeah, Eureka, look. He says, look at this x-ray. Look at that look at that bone growth, that's great. So I say, great, Roger, it looks like we're going to Greenland and Iceland. <laughs> the doctor who doesn't know Roger says, well, we'll see about that. <laughs> so hard, really. You think of any say of what Roger goes to Iceland. He says it doesn't hurt anymore, we're going. So we went. We went. And we got on this boat. They told Brittany and me that there was no way we could get Roger on this boat. It was impossible to get a man in a wheelchair. We said, well, can you show it to us? Nothing for us. We got him on. And this is what the, this is in Greenland. This is what the ice looks like. It's that blue. Completely untouched. So beautiful. And there we are in the ice fields of, of, of uh, Greenland. And check that out. That's the sort of thing that just comes floating out of that glacier. Amazing. This is an interesting story just because, and we're going fast, you guys. I know it's been a long night. But um, this, we particularly love this man because when we landed in Tehran, Iran, and you cannot get on a plane, by the way, to go to Iran unless you are fully covered up. A woman named, get on in Germany, well, you better be dressed right or they will not let you on the plane. So anyway, we were going to Iran. We're excited about the trip. We got to Iran. Roger's wheelchair had been so badly crushed in baggage claims, so that, that four huge men could not open it, couldn't budge it, couldn't open it. So it was completely crushed, you know. And uh, we looked at this, and our guide said, we are going to Esfahan, the city of Aspen. They can build anything, and they will fix this. Okay, so the airport loaned us one of their, you know, passenger uh, wheelchairs. And this man and his team fixed Roger's wheelchair in Esfahan. <laughs> and so and it's still one we travel with today. And here we are in beautiful this, Esfahan. Okay. Take it. This is no, Khomeini. No, no, I'm going to take it. You're taking it. Okay, <laughs> he's taking it. This is Khomeini Square. Uh, these bridges go back hundreds of years. We're here with Missy and Kelsey. And that's the way we dress. And it was a hot day. Because yeah. that's the way we were dressed in Iran. You have to dress like that. Um, this is a specially holy place, and you, you have to do more than just cover your head and wear what they call a manto, which is just a raincoat, and uh, they have to hide their hands. Uh, here we're at Persepolis, goes back 2,500 years, um, to Darius the Great, and it's pretty well preserved. Persepolis, of course, is a Greek word, if you think of it. 
the city of the Persians. Um, they went to get some water, and I was with a guy when we talked about Zoroastrianism and the history of um, Iran, and I was looking at this bottle of relief. It was huge, and there were all these carvings. And I, I said, what is that bottle of relief? Because there were 30 rock carvings. And he said, well, those were the satrapies of Darius the Great. And I realized the first time what an incredible upset it was that the Greeks beat the Persians. <laughs> first time in, Darius, 490, his father of Cyrus, and, before, and then after that, Xerxes. And all those legends are not so exaggerated. It's, it's like, I don't want to sell Oxy's baseball team, but Oxy's baseball team is beating the Yankees or something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Persephone was beautiful, and at one point I said to my guy, you know, we do believe, of course, we didn't Rome do as the Romans do. I mean, it's not for me to be critical of the way women dress in our man. I would do that, and I never said anything to the guy. Of course, it's rude. You know, go there. If you're, you know, I can have my opinions, but I don't need to say it to people who live there. However, uh, our guy, we knew for about a week, and um, it was 108, and we were dressed like that. He's wearing a golf shirt. Yeah. And I said, yeah, it's really a hot day. He was very kind. And he said, um, oh, are you hot? And I said, well, I went to my closet today and I thought, hmm, 108 degrees. I'll get fully dressed and then I'll put this black and then this black, <laughs> black, 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 and I'm ready to go out into Persepolis with no shade. He said, I never thought that. <laughs> We're in Vietnam. And here we're in Vietnam, and you can't see anything here but rubble. We are in a sort of a little jungle area. In fact, our guide said, here's a little clearing in the woods. He said, can you find the entrance to a Vietnam tunnel? We and we all looked, Kelsey, Missy, um, and we couldn't. Because they, it was covered like that. So they covered that little piece of the, the, the little roof Missy is going to drop down into that little hole. No American soldier would pack on his foot in that little hole if they could even find it. And then they cover it up. She did not want to go all the way down. She's nervous. It's very dark in there. And so we're going through various tunnels. And here, I love this picture because Missy really was an Olympic athlete. Missy was training for the Olympics. And to get through here, you may have somebody may have to come up here and get me back up. Anyway, Missy, Roger. Back on the back wheels, like this. <laughs> Kelsey and me, Roger's shoelaces on our hands and knees, pulling. Where my mind? Hands and knees, pulling. Missy like that, and Roger, in 1968. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. Oh, no, I want to see the top. Okay, that's. We crossed in, oh, the, you may, you know, you, you were old, old, older, sorry about that. No, but there was a demilitarized zone that divided north and south Vietnam. If once you go across the demilitarized zone, it is pockmarked with American bombs. <laughs> this was an American bomb, but now it's a little pond for fish, probably, and cattle to, to eat. And we had what was called a pre fire zone. And North Vietnam was a free fire zone. You could kill anything you wanted. Literally, chickens, cows, children, women, old men, young men, whatever you wanted to kill. I mean, this is a horrible, stupid war that cost three million lives, not counting Cambodia. Actually, the, what many just described very well is a little village that decided, well, they're going to live underground. And so when we got through the tunnel with Missy pushing like this and Mandy and Kelsey pulling, the, I shook the hand of the guy. First person in a wheelchair ever through that tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> it was a whole underground city. The village had just carved out. At a hospital. Hospital maternity wards, you know, sleeping things. They just went underground. It was, uh, and which one did they do that? Um, now we're in Pakistan, very proud of their second nuclear bomb uh, missile. And we're going across the Karakoram Highway. The Karakoram Highway uh, is closed now. Uh, <coughs> it, 22 miles of it are completely impassable. It took them 25 years to build. Roger was determined 
go across the Karakoram Highway. I gotta say, there was so many landslides that you just sort of see, we come around the corner, all big boulders in the middle of the road. And I'd look and I think, the same thing at the time, but I think, huh, did that come down the last month? Did that come down last week? Was that five minutes ago? <laughs> 30 seconds ago? So I was determined, Karakoram was, uh, was the capital of uh, Genghis Khan, way up in Mongolia, but it's gone, I mean, it's destroyed now. Um, that's the name they gave it. The Pakistanis and the Chinese decided to build this friendship highway that linked the two countries up in the way northwest of Pakistan. And I saw that the trip was there and I just had to go on it. So at first we were going to fly to a certain place. I didn't really want to and I was glad the plane was canceled because of bad weather. And so we could drive the whole thing. And the first night we stayed in a little hotel, a really sweet little hotel right by the Indus River, and I went to bed at night thinking that we're somewhere near Alexander the Great's armies, and they must have camped somewhere near that, the Indus River, which is mostly now in Pakistan. And then the next day we started out, and the driver checked with his home office, and he said, well, we've got to turn around. And I said, wait, why? And he said, well, people are throwing rocks at tourists. I said, well, go find out more details. I don't want to, I don't want to go around yet. He said, okay. So he called again. I said, okay, we can go, because it was Little Pebbles by Little Boys. Oh, we got some Swedish and French bicycle riders who were in their short shorts, which we were. So, okay, we can go on. We come up, and now we come up on a real landslide. And he says, we got to turn around. I said, wait a minute, let me go see the landslide, because I know in landslides you can usually find part of the road left that you can walk over. So we go to... The uh, landslide. But before we go to the landslide, I just jumped a, uh, a slide on this and tell you real quickly because we are having lunch with the uh, that. Like no, <coughs> uh, we were told by our guide that he did have really scrawny chicken at a little terrible hotel. That's where we slated for. We can have fresh goat, fresh goat, steaming rice at a little roadside stand. Um, he said the only thing is that uh, the only people who are eating there are you know members of the Taliban, and I'm turning to Roger. This was two years before 9/11. Remind me who the Taliban is now. Anyway, so um, so they said you'll leave your passports in the car. Uh, they won't like it if they know that you're Americans. We'll say you're Swiss doctors, and we had a very fine meal. The same. And Missy, who's there, what loves little children. If she sees she's a twin, and she sees uh, a twin, she just goes nuts. But she saw a little boy playing, because women don't get out of this village. She saw a little boy playing. Never she she just started getting closer and closer. And by the time she was playing with this little boy, the Taliban were kind of warm enough to us. So. We were told not to touch anybody. Come back here. Yeah, because that's a woman. Boy. She's a little boy's baby. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, let's go to the landslide. There's a landslide. And um, Manny did a really good job of getting some men to hold my wheelchair. I, there were six men holding my wheelchair and then they could walk around the, the what was left of the road and a lot of, very rocky and then we could get to the road on the other side and there were people there too who wanted to go this way but they obviously couldn't so they would want to turn around and take us to the Hunza Valley which was our goal. And so Kelsey could easily scamper over. Mandy was going to get to have the heaviest pack with all our medicine, all of our passports and papers and visas and everything. And she took out off on these big boulders and was having a terrible time and nobody would touch her hand. And until finally she got help from a German tourist who could give her a hand up. And the only reason I've even left Roger, because I don't, um, is that we were so sure that they understood how to carry him, and I was going to get a picture for the Christmas card. But I needed to get a little distance. So foolishly, I left him. I said, here, my father, get the picture. Anyway. So we we started out, and I mean, I, I found started out, and I realized these weren't the same men in training. And fortunately, Missy was there. Hi, Missy. And um, uh, she probably saved my life because she said, no, no, put him down. And then she, with the guide, gave instructions, don't hold the wheels because you hold the wheels, it goes whoosh. And then Roger turns. And Something then, will turn on a wheelchair. And, and I was holding on thinking this may be it, but boy, that's a beautiful 
day. <laughs> uh, I could see Kelsey was safe, and I could see Mandy over there, and then we finally got over there. And um, uh, I'll, I'll just skip ahead and say that we're in our hotel the next morning, and it's early, very early, and I wake up, and Mandy is in the window just bawling her eyes out. I said, man, we're safely in the Hoosa Valley. What, what's wrong? And she said, I almost killed you, and I didn't get a picture. <laughs> That's what it looked like. That's what it looked like. Under the other side. But yep. this is where we're going, to the Hoosa Valley. Now, those of you who are older know the book and the movie Lost Horizons, right? Some of you see some nodding heads. And, um, it's based on the Hunza Valley, Shangri-La, the myth of Shangri-La, you're in the Himalayas and suddenly you come to this green spot. Well, it really is a paradise. Not only are there six mountains 20,000 feet or higher, two of them are 25,000 feet. <coughs> Everest is only 29. Um, oh, wait, wait. Um, and not, not only that, but it's an enlightened community. It's a, Ismailis, a Shiite sect who believe in education for women, they don't have to stay indoors, they have a 95% literacy rate, they control their own valley. It was really a wonderful place to be. And that's, those are two of the peaks that we saw. And we finally made it all the way to China, and then this is a really sad part of the presentation. Because this is Gory Island, off the coast of Senegal. And of course, if you're going to capture and trade slaves, you're going to put them on an island where it's really long swim back. Sorry. And this is our guide, Bala, a wonderful man. And Dan's with us, of course. And um, we're going in to, I don't know what to call it. It's kind of built like a fort or a castle. Upstairs are the slaveholders. They're making fun. They're having, you know, parties and and slave women and um, enjoying themselves. Where down below, the slaves are shackled in, and and they really were with either a bare slit you can see outside, or like Kelsey in this one, you can't see at all. Terrible conditions. Um, this is called the the door of no return. And you can see it narrows to where only one person can go through at a time, one adult anyway, can go through at a time. That's to prevent rebellions or people trying to kill themselves or anything like that. Um, I, I was looking at today and, you know, it, somewhere between 15 and 20 million um, Africans were shipped to the Americas. <laughs> Another 2 million died on the way. So it's... I don't know, it's a real, a real genocide, but it's a real tragedy. Uh, this is just, we, we're on our very final stories here. We thank you for your patience. Um, but this is a funny story. We were in the Cote d'Ivoire, and we were seeing the panther dance at a village. And the villagers had come out for the panther dance, and those people you just saw, the men who were completely covered, were doing the great panther dance. And we were told by our guide that when the panther dance was over, if we wanted, we could join all the villagers in the dancing and the merrymaking that would be had all the drums and people singing. It was a big deal. And so when it was over, Kelsey and I went out <coughs> the day, and we went out to dance. And I turned to Kelsey and I said, Kelsey, you know, they were doing cartwheels. You take gymnastics at home. Why don't you do a cartwheel? Show what you can do what they can do in the panther dance. So Kelsey dutifully, you know, little teeny girl, like this, drums stop. <laughs> The party stops <laughs> and everybody backs away. <laughs> Dead silence. Just Kelsey and me in the middle of what was the party. <laughs> no drugs, no nothing. And everybody's staring at us, in silence. I've obviously done something horrible. Kelsey's scared. <laughs> We're just sort of holding each other, and our guy goes over and has a long talk with the chief. Long talk. And he comes over to us and he said, um, they had no idea a white person could do that. Would she do it again? Kelsey, do three. <laughs> the dancing went on. And then I was taking a picture of Kelsey with all the little children, and all the men who had been doing the panther dance just shoved those little kids out of the way so they could stand with a little white girl. <laughs> and they're doing 
going to tell you a few short stories, but really, when we went to Dubai, we found out we were going to Johannesburg. We found that we could take Emirates Airlines, and that stopped in Dubai. We thought, wow, let's go to, you know, let's have a couple of days in Dubai on our way to Johannesburg. And Dubai is extraordinary. I looked it up because I thought, where is Dubai in terms of tourist spots? One of the top 10 <coughs> tourist spots in the world. Dubai is eight, and the United States doesn't have one city on the top 10. You know, London, Rome, Paris, Bangkok, Dubai, Shanghai, lots of places. No, not the United States, but Dubai is this up is there. This is a hotel. And it's getting, getting to be higher. The buildings are unique. And then look at the one that's twisted. Crazy architecture. Beautiful. Um, this is the tallest building. They're building another one somewhere else, but the tallest building in the world. And if you Google uh, Burj Khalifa, which is the name of this tower, and those are really tall buildings at its feet. But if you Google Tom Cruise and Burj Khalifa, there's a picture of him sitting on the top of that point. It's scary. Because one of his Mission Impossible uh, movies was filmed on the outside of it. They hanging, fighting all over the outside of it. Um, we were in the largest shopping mall in the world, of course. They're going to do a lot by land, which is going to be better than any Disneyland ever. You know, everything's going to be the biggest and the best. And we're in the largest shopping mall in the world. And there are girls in tank tops and people like this, and Sheets, and Chelsea, and and you can go ski. Oh, and Cartier, and you know every kind of store. And now you, you can go ski. It was over 100 degrees outside, but you can go ski in Dubai if you want. And this is inside a shopping mall. And they have all the outfits. They take a look at you. They take your size. They let Roger go out. They put Kelsey and me in ski gear. We just went up the chairlift. We weren't gonna, you know, waste Roger's time by skiing, but we could have. And but Kelsey did go down in that. <laughs> 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 This is our, uh, we have uh, just two more things we want to say. Um, when I told people about this who are on their way to London, they stop and go there now. This is the Blue Lagoon in Iceland. It's right near the airport. And if you fly Icelandic air to uh, London, you can stop over, and it is spectacular. The Blue Lagoon is a natural hot springs. Rogers all loaded up. I call them because in Iceland, they they like hot tubbing, they like their thermal waters, they get in the waters a lot. And when they, and every small town has thermal waters, and the women get dressed in a communal place, and nobody is shy, they all strip down together, they're very happy. And the men go in their communal place, and they strip down, and they're very happy, and then they meet. Well, I was trying to figure out where we were going to help with Roger, because I can't take him into the women's where everybody's all stripped down, and I can't go into the men's where everybody's all stripped down. But it turns out there's extraordinary handicap um, facilities. They have bathing suits, they have everything you need, and here we are in our handicap facilities. I mean, we're talking beautiful showers, bars everywhere, tons of room for a wheelchair. I mean, they really have it completely figured out. In fact, in Iceland, uh, I would say it was the most extraordinary handicap facilities we've ever seen somewhere. True in Finland as well, probably all over Scandinavia. Wow. Really, really helpful um, in terms of the elbow room you have, and it's super considerate, considerate and thought out. And here we are in the Blue Lagoon. And the Blue Lagoon is huge, and it is runs from uh, 98 to 102 degrees. That's that you know you can just find out the hotter spots or whatever. But it's it's no cooler than 98, no hotter than 102. And you can have a massage in the water. That is where I had cherry crab. <laughs> and now uh, we're at the end of our presentation. We'll give one more thing that we want to say. I think we're called. Of course, want to thank you for coming. But there's a, another group of people that we haven't mentioned. But again, we couldn't travel without the wonderful helpers that we have. But you know, we wouldn't travel at all if it wasn't for the wonderful physicians we had. And it turns out that Roger's best friend is also a group to be a doctor. He's mattered a lot in our lives as he read. My best friend in high school, Elaine Constance, grew to be a doctor. She's been really important in our life. My sister Jessie is a doctor and has several times flown across the country in the middle of the night because I've called her just to tell her something that's going on. She's got to go, catch your play. You know, and she's over. We've had, you know, Dr. Muller, Dr. Fan, uh, Dr. Earhart, Dr. Cracciola, and his incredible searching hands doing all kinds of, you know, wonderful tricks on Roger. And so we're going to end with one story about a doctor, which is one of our very favorite stories. Dr. Kovner, Dr. Kovner is a travel doctor, retired, 
But it means that when we would go to Africa, we needed to find out whether we needed yellow fever shots or whether we needed rabies shots. <laughs> Wherever the heck we were going, these doctors are specialists in travel. You know, travel and you know what you might need. Are you just staying in the city or are you going out to the country? You know, they know everything that you need to know. And one time we went to Dr. Coger's and he told us the following story. He said, you know, I write, along with another team of travel doctors, the questions for the medical exam that certifies travel doctors. And last week, he said, I was uh, at, um, uh, we were going over the questions for the certification, and one of the doctors in the room said, uh, we have to throw out one of your uh, questions, Dr. Kovner. We have to throw it out. He said, really? W which one is that? He said, well, you have one that's just kind of ridiculous. And he said, excuse me, what one is that? Well, it says this. A 48-year-old man with severe rheumatoid arthritis and multiple joint replacements, um, and on this medicine and in this condition, and all of this, you know, blah, 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 is in a wheelchair and wants to go on a trip to West Africa. And he is on this medication and this medication and this medication, and the question is, what do you give him for malaria? And Dr. Kovner said, and what is wrong with that question? He said, because there isn't a person on the planet West Africa. And Dr. Coker said, that patient was in my office last week. His name is Roger Boche. And what is the answer? They said, you know someone like that? Roger Boche. And he said, uh, and the answer to the question is, you give him nothing. Because one of the medications that Roger was on uh, actually works as an anti-malarial as well. It's on for arthritis, but uh, it what, we're, uh, he didn't need to take anything for malaria. He had enough of the stuff in his system. <laughs> 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 we off any bugs. We want to thank you so thank much you. for coming tonight. Anybody wants to ask us? Should we all just go? But if anybody wants to leave, feel free. Absolutely. Anybody wants to ask a question, come on Just in. if nobody had any questions. <laughs> I think we covered it. I think we did. Okay. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank <laughs> you.